Welcome to the awards ceremony for the 2022 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. I'm your host, Mr. G. I'd like to thank you all for joining me from your many different time zones around the world to celebrate the regional winners and the overall winner of this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Let's take a quick look at what's coming up. We'll hear from the Director General of the Commonwealth Foundation, Anne Gallagher, and this year's prize chair, Fred Degar. We'll meet the regional winners and hear them read extracts from their winning stories, and we'll also catch up with last year's winner, Tanya de Almeida. Of course, we'll be announcing the overall winner of this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize right at the end. So make sure that you stay tuned. Don't forget to join us on social media using our hashtag CWPrize and say hello in the chat. Now it's time to introduce Anne Gallagher, the Director General of the Commonwealth Foundation. Thank you, Mr. G. I'm so happy to be joining you all to celebrate our talented regional winners. And of course, to discover with you who will be the overall winner of the 2022 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Now in its 11th year, the prize is going from strength to strength. We had a record number of entries in 2022, a strong indicator of how central storytelling is to our lives, helping us understand ourselves and our surroundings and helping us examine and make sense of this world that we all share. The organisation I lead, the Commonwealth Foundation, was created to serve the needs of the 2.5 billion citizens of the Commonwealth. Supporting storytelling, ensuring people's voices are heard and their stories reach a wider audience is a vital part of what we do. To the thousands of writers who sent us their stories each year, we say thank you. It's an honour to receive and read your work and we're heartened by the many comments we receive about the positive impact of the prize. We owe a special debt of gratitude to those who work so hard to help identify the very best stories from around the Commonwealth. You, our readers and judges, are absolutely integral to the success of the prize and we thank you for your service. And finally, on behalf of the Commonwealth Foundation and on behalf of everyone who's done so much to bring together this year's prize, I want to thank all of you for being here and sharing this special moment with us. Irrespective of our different cultures, languages and traditions, we all know in our hearts that stories matter. Stories signal eternal truths that we all recognise. They serve as a powerful reminder of our common humanity and of the ties that bind us together, a reminder of what truly matters about being alive. Thank you. And back to you, Mr G. Thanks, Anne. We all know the Commonwealth Short Story Prize is global. Just look at how many of us there are from all over the world to support our winning writers. But the prize isn't just the most international, it's also the world's most inclusive. It's free to enter and open to citizens from all 54 Commonwealth countries. This year, we received 6,730 unpublished short stories in 12 languages. Every single one of those stories was read by our dedicated team of readers in its original language. 200 stories were long listed and sent to our panel of judges, who then had the difficult task of selecting only 26 for this shortlist. This year's judges are Louise Umatoni Bauer, Africa, Janavi Barua, Asia, Stefano Stefanidis, Canada and Europe, Kevin Jared Hussein, Caribbean. Janine Lian, Pacific. This year's prize chair is the Guyanese writer Fred Degas. Fred joins us now from Los Angeles. My name is Fred Degas, and I chaired this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize. My fellow regional judges and I had a lot of fun reading the many entries. It was hard work, but pleasurable work, and coming up with a rich shortlist and with five regional winners. I hope in reading the shortlists and the winners, you'll agree with us that the short story, despite the pandemic, the short story is in good health. It can remains 
preoccupied with issues governing the world right now. It remains an art form that's concerned to keep a reader and listener engaged, surprised. It's aware as a form of its tradition, from narrative to experimentation and everything in between. And I think it's looking to a future where it continues to compel readers and listeners and writers. So I hope you enjoy the shortlists and the regional winners. And go back to the ADA site for the Commonwealth Prize to see previous year winners as you consider throwing your hat into the ring and joining in a global community of readers and writers. Thanks. From the short list of 26 stories, the judges selected five outstanding regional winners who each received £2,500 and full membership to the London Library. This year's overall winner receives £5,000 and two years full membership. For the second year running, we'd like to thank our partners at the London Library for their generosity, which gives our winners in person and remote access to the library's extensive collection of over a million books and manuscripts. Now it's my pleasure to introduce this year's regional winners. Ansika Kota, Africa. Sophia Maria Ma, Asia. Cecil Brown, Canada and Europe. Diana McCauley, Caribbean. Mary Rokonadravu, Pacific. Ansika Kota from Eswatini is the regional winner for Africa with his story, And the Earth Drank Deep. Let's meet him now. The greatest aid to my creative process is being able to, you know, meditate sort of um, in my environment. My name is Ntiga Koda. I'm from Babane, which is the capital of Eswatini. I write what I see essentially and what I feel and that's all driven by the environment that I live in, that I grew up in, like specifically in Pine Valley, I think, you know, being able to just be outside and sort of, you know, stare at like existence and just let my mind just wander over concepts, wander over, you know, the day or, you know, just move around freely mentally. I think that's, that's what, even if I'm not going to write at that moment, that's what sort of allows ideas to, you know, brew in my head for later. I, occasionally, you know, you have these thoughts like, what would the first serial killer be like? You know, who would, like, who would they target? How would it work? How would their environment, their society respond to them? That question just sort of kept repeating itself in my mind until eventually I wanted to explore it. I wanted to think like, what would that look like? How would that work? My design of the hunter as a character was really just what would happen if we just remove empathy? Like, how does a person behave when you switch off the empathy or when you switch off that unnatural, you know, disinclination to violence? Who we are today is very, very similar to who we were, you know, as the first humans 200,000 years ago. It's just our environment is quite different. If we were to transpose you or me or anybody into that environment, our behavior would be just the same as theirs was then. And I think I'd like to just get across that sense that they were us and we are them. It was such an honour to serve as one of the judges for this year's Commonwealth Short Story Prize, and particularly as the judge for the Africa region. The submissions from the region were such a joy to read. I was incredibly impressed by the quality of the stories that are coming out of the continent. Reading these stories felt like a journey across the continent and the result a rich tapestry of narratives and experiences. And the earth drank deeps to tall amongst the list of giants. It was a universal story that immediately drew us all in as judges. It was both bold and yet simple. I'm delighted that you get to encounter this story in the following excerpt cool morning air rushed into and out of the hunter's lungs. The still dew damp grass wet his legs to the thighs as he charged through it. His prey, Anyala, was fleeing right into the path of the rest of the party, downwind and invisible in the tall grass. As the panicked animal fled, the hunter watched a single spear arc gracefully aloft 
and find its mark in the Nyala's flank. The beast continued to run, its pace steadily slowing as it fell to the ground. In the excitement of his first real hunt, he was the quickest to reach the downed animal. The young man was surprised to find it was still alive, breathing heavily with a pool of blood forming. He looked into its bovine eyes, filled with exhausted panic or resignation. He wasn't sure, but he was drawn to it. The pain, the suffering. He found his own breathing was harder now than before, and his heart was pounding. He reached for the shaft of the spear buried in body flesh and twisted it gently, wrapped as the eyes widened and the nyala let out a weak grunt of pain. With his attention completely focused on the wounded animal at his feet, the hunter reached over with his other hand to get a better grip on the spear. He was startled out of his trance by a quick thrust of another spear directly into the Nyala's heart. It stopped moving immediately. He looked up and saw Zungu staring back with a mixture of disapproval and irritation. Zungu scolded him for letting the beast suffer, implying that he must not have been ready to join a true hunt. The hunter apologized, showing sufficient deference to cover up, he hoped, the enjoyment that must have been plastered all over his face just seconds before. The rest of the party soon joined them and they set about gutting their kill, removing the offal with sharp, sharpened stone knives before mounting the carcass on a long yoke for the trek home. By the time they were done and ready to head back, the sun was already approaching Zenith, bringing with it the biting heat of summer. The party began the return journey with Zungu, leading them in a victory song. They left the pile of offal for scavengers to find. In the monotony of the march back, the hunter relived the Nyala's death over and over again in his mind. He could smell his blood whenever the wind blew right, but not now that it was meat, it was of little interest to him. The more he thought about it, the more he realized that his fascination came from seeing the essence of life extinguished. The fear and confusion and pain. He had seen death before, during funeral rites and seasons past, but he only now made the connection between the two. Life and death. Death and dying. He eagerly looked forward to the next hunt. Thank you, Nsika. From the earth to the ocean now, as we meet our regional winner for Asia, Sophia Maria Ma from Singapore, whose story is the last diver on Earth. When I think about diving, I think about the ocean. And what I wanted to write about was living close and in the ocean. My name is Sophia Maria Ma, and I'm from the small island nation of Singapore. Living in Singapore is a truly unique experience. On the one hand, we are living in a very urbanized environment. We are surrounded by buildings. Our population density is so high, right? So we are always surrounded by people. And so people is also at the heart of, of Singapore. At the same time that I want to have modernity in my stories, I also want to capture that, that culture, the tradition, that history of people. At, at the time that I was writing The Last Dive on Earth, it is true that there were a lot of news reports that were happening at that time. And the news reports were about uh, flooding. And it was very severe flooding happening across the region, across the world. The, the community that I drew reference from would be the Bajau people. Who is, they, they are kind of like a fishing community, a, a diving community, a sea community. And I wanted to see this huge global problem that's happening, which is climate change, from the eyes of these individuals who are, who are really experiencing it and living it and suffering for it. I hope that my audience members can uh, go through the journey with the main character. She's following in the mother's footsteps. Uh, as a free diver. To me, the act of diving is almost the act, like the act of writing. It's a solar journey into your own mind. And when you are diving, and you're diving in deep depths, it's almost as if you're alone. So writing is, is the same, like you are in your own mind. How do you know that your writing sense? How do you know that people even want to hear what you want to say? Uh, how do you know that you can connect with anyone else outside of your mind? It's so hard to talk about Asian culture. It is so diverse. And while there might be some commonalities right, in the Asian region amongst the different Asian cultures and religions and traditions and practices and rituals, at the same time, it, it's also very difficult to communicate it. 
so that when the Asian um, judge judged my story and found it to be meaningful and that it touched their hearts, I think, um, just brought me great joy. It was an absolute delight reading the brilliant selection of short stories submitted from the Asia region this year for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. The stories explored diverse themes such as politics, family, love, and even the environment. What I and my fellow judges were looking for was that one story that would move us, that would stay with us long after we read it. And the last dive on earth from Singapore did exactly that. A powerful story which is rooted in a local fishing community off the coast in Indonesia. And while it is rooted very firmly in the local, the themes explored, those of love, of family, of the deep bond between mother and child, and of the threat to our environment, are nothing if not universal. This story was a standout story for my fellow judges and I, and I hope you will enjoy this little reading of it which follows. When they finally found Ibu, she was laid out on the beach. Draped in a shroud of slimy, rusted kelp, she looked like a giant glutinous rice dessert encased in steamed bamboo leaves. It wasn't unusual that she was naked. Here, we dived naked. Of the coast of the lesser Sanda Islands, between the seas of Banda and Florence. But seeing her like this, I remembered Ibu's promise. She had told me she wanted to be the last freediver on earth. She forbade me from going into the water, the water we both love. But whoever really listens to their own mother. With our lives so intertwined with the sea, Ibu and I had always lived with death as our fickle, wearisome neighbour. In the good years, death kept to himself. When things were bad, we would see him wandering the coast and picking at debris, at bodies, as in the aftermath of a tsunami. Sometimes we would see him watching eagerly as sharks prowled the shallow, nearshore waters for easy pickings. Well, not too easy, since we, Bajau, learn to swim before we walk or talk. But easier than, say, venturing into the dark, frigid depths without coming across a meal for weeks. Still, I never expected to come across my own mother's body on land rather than in the sea. A small crowd had gathered around Iwu by the time I arrived. No one spoke, no one so much as breathed, as if out of respect for the woman they recognised as their dukun, their medicine woman, who taught them to harvest remedies from the waters around them. Need a quick pain reliever? agitated an ointment from the venom of chestnut-coloured cone shells. Want to disinfect a wound? Cultivate a salve from the vast-shaped glass sponges. Her marine knowledge unparalleled Ibu seemed chosen by the sea. Its crystalline blue waters formed her skin. Its rippled, foamy white waves like mottled sapphires took the place of her clothes which kept a warm and stormy days when the water temperatures would drop, drop, drop. Rumi. I knew it was Professor Arisa even before she called for me, her stiff, gnarled fingers gripping my shoulder and pinching me right to my bone. Lanky and wiry, few were not convinced that Arisa was in her 70s and suffered from severe arthritis. She often enlisted Ibu's help with her sensitive hands and inflamed joints to carry out her research in the twilight zone of the Mesophatic Reef. This was where sunlight reached its end and the abyss began, and where if life could resist death's gravity of the deep, it would move to thrive to brighter, warmer oceans. Since it was already too expensive to use offshore deep vessels and submersibles to locate and collect samples of new marine species, Arisa was relieved to have found a natural deep diver in Ibu to aid her in the discoveries, particularly in places that were too erratic, too intricate. 
Nonetheless, as we dived, scrubbing the bleached reefs or surveying the continental shelf, she always came with us. She, in her full diving gear, wetsuit, rebreather, computer, Ibu and I, armed only with our spears, our intergenerational map of the sea, imprinted into our minds, our muscle memory. Thank you, Sophia. Before we meet our remaining regional winners, let's catch up with last year's overall winner, Tanya de Almeida, who joins us now from Sri Lanka. It's hard to believe that only a year has passed since I found out I won the prize, because so much has changed for me since then. I've signed on with a literary agency in the UK, and I'm very close to completing my debut short story collection. I also recently learned that I won an ALCS Tom Gallon Trust Award, awarded by the Society of Authors for my short story, which appeared on Granda. And so I continue to be really overwhelmed and humbled by the opportunities that this prize has laid before me. It's also very important for me to share with all of you that I'm speaking from my home country, Sri Lanka, which is in the midst of the largest mass peaceful social movement in our history. And I'm so honored that I've been able to lend my voice to that movement in ways that would never have been possible for me before the national recognition I received after winning the Commonwealth Prize. And now I'll let you all get back to the main event because like all of you, I'm so eager to learn who this year's winner is. Thank you, Kenya. Let's continue getting to know our regional winners. Cecil Brown from the UK is the regional winner for Canada and Europe with his story, A Hat for Lemma. My stories are set mainly in the Caribbean. I'm trying to portray people who are trying to forge a life for themselves. My name is Cecil Brown. I was born in St. Vincent and the Grenadines a long time ago, but I moved to the UK to join my parents in my teens, and I've lived and worked in the UK ever since. I'm Caribbean as well as Black British. When Lemma spoke to me, she, she's almost saying, I have a story and I want my story told. I, I don't want to keep it to myself. I want others to, 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 to listen to me. When you start to write a story, in a sense, you're, you're just digging and not quite at random, but you're, you're planting a seed, as it were, uh, looking for the right place to locate it within the ground feeding it the, the ingredients, the, the things that come from your mind in the same way that you feed water into the ground. And then finally, there's that sense of fulfillment when, when a flower or tomatoes or peppers uh, suddenly surface after weeks in the ground. And it's a similar thing with a story. We invite people into our homelands, into our country, our region, via the, the medium of fiction. Anybody reading the story, no matter where they're from, hopefully would be drawn in to, 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 to Lemma and, and say, yes, I can recognize something of myself in this person. So that's what I would hope, that they're able to go home or at some time they might be sitting quietly and Lemma will come into their minds and they'll say, yes, uh, good on you, Lemma. Uh, thank you for your story. Greetings from Cyprus. I'm Stefano Stefanidis, and I represent the region of Europe and Canada, a vast region spanning from the East Mediterranean to the Pacific, and also with large immigrant communities from Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. So it's not surprising that four of the eight sh shortlisted stories for the region actually came from beyond the region. Um, the winning story, um, A Hat for Lemmer by Cecil Brown, struck us all right from the beginning, um, mainly for the voice of the protagonist that is full of verb, spoken in the Creole vernacular of St. Vincent, and the setting, which is in post-emancipation St. Vincent in the 1850s, and evokes beautifully the social, cultural, tensions at that historical moment. I've been really looking forward to hearing the voice of the author himself, 
So I'm now delighted to introduce him so he can read a selection, a short part of the story for us. Noise hit me right behind the sweet smell of hot food. Whiskey and rum thicken the cigar smoke. Two men in white strumming quattros in a corner, sailors singing merrily along. Women from the estates in their best clothes parading with soldiers, hugging up so tight like they twine. Parlor the women dancing in the middle of the room. Which angel teach them such pretty steps? In long frilly dresses, every hue of black and every shade of white parcel out between them. My coarse brown dress just one stitch up from rags. I stare at the woman in admiration and in shame. What you want? I turn to my right to see you touch me on the shoulder. I find a woman, same age and blackness, with a fragrant smell of ripe cocoa to my sweaty cinnamon. The woman's purple dress flow down to her ankles. I make to answer, but her almond-shaped eyes so bewitching, she locked the words in my throat. If you're looking to join Whisper, sorry, I shake my head quick. You're searching for somebody then, a white man, Wesley String. He tell you to meet him here? No. What then? I just have to find him, and quick. You sound like a country Mary, the woman say. Outside cooler, follow me. Out in the light, the woman lower herself onto a log and fold her purple dress between her thighs. You're a white man, she said. You making his baby? No, this estate owner pay me to find him. How he described, tall under a felt hat. Good heap of size women frolic here. Once a ship dock, the woman can't rest. This man more resemble a schoolmaster. The woman consider. And twin with a fat man? Brisbane large, string heightened, so I nod, maybe. Yes, those two revel here, brandy upon whiskey. But the girls couldn't get a task out of them. Woman food too rich for some taste. They still ate? No, a new set of men storm whisper at dusk, and the teacher and the whale dive deep. But why? Men only dock when they have something to hide. I don't know what made me do it, but I stoop and stretch for the woman's hands. They're soft and warm. I pray my trembling fingers don't tell her it's the first time I touch another person. She let her fingers rest in mine. I have to stop myself caressing them. Stop by Grenville Street after you find your husband's string, the woman say. Ask for whisper. You own the tavern? Yes, country Mary. Thank you, Cecil. For the Caribbean, our regional winner is Diana McCauley from Jamaica with her story, Bridge Over the Yalas River. I have a very strong sense of place, so I hope a reader will really feel that they are present in Jamaica. That they can smell the place, see the place, experience the place. My name is Diana McCauley, and I'm a Jamaican writer. I was born here and I've lived all my life in the capital city of Kingston. I really try to, to write from my heart and, and do justice to the place and the people I'm writing about. You have to show up before the page, you have to put down your words, you have to submit them somewhere, they are going to be rejected, you have to deal with the rejection, and you must have faith in your own work. The theme of my story draws on my years of environmental work, where I saw what we loosely call development, bringing both benefits and costs to communities. I saw so often work coming to a community and making things better for a short period of time, and then the work would move on and the community would be back to where it was before the work started. And I started to think, well, suppose that didn't happen. Suppose all that happened was we built things, we tore them down, we built them again. So I wanted to write about the tension between that. What happens when a father has to choose between his daughter's health and his own livelihood? This is the issue of our time. You know, how is it that we, how can we live in more respectful and sustainable ways on the earth? My name is Kevin Jared Hussein, the regional judge for the Caribbean arm of the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. This year, the Caribbean entries encompass two themes, the preservation of one's beliefs, and the reclamation of one's feet. 
from a grim story about the domestic darkness of a disillusioned mother to one where Natia takes a primeval and sentient voice as it tries to reclaim itself from a hotel developer to an unconventional symbiotic relationship that forms between Jamaican and Chinese laborers as they work to rebuild a bridge. That last story is Bridge Over the Yalas River by Jamaican writer Diana McCauley. The story transports the reader to the small, neglected, storm-struck village of Baktu, where both a physical and metaphorical bridge has been broken. The judges selected it because of its ability to wield complex issues with such a simple conflict. The village and its laborers are used as a microcosm of the socio-economic and environmental issues that are played up only for short-term political gain. The politics are likely distinctly Caribbean, but the theme of reclaiming one's own fate is universal. It is a clever tale that I like to describe as one of both construction and destruction. And now I am honored to introduce Diana McCauley, who is going to read an excerpt from Bridge Over the Alice River. Thank you. When sins thunderstorm mean disaster, thought Roy. He waited to count the seconds between lightning and thunder, assessing how far away the storm was. Rain pounded on the zinc roof. Flash, flash, then a rolling boom which traveled from sky to earth and shook his bed. Six seconds, not that close. He couldn't hear his daughter's breathing, so he bent over her, feeling her breath feathering his cheek. A storm could cause her to have an asthma attack, and the roads were probably already impassable. Dina began to wheeze. Sit up, pumpkin, Roy said, pulling her into his arms. Where your inhaler? Dina reached under her pillow, her eyes unfocused. She shook the inhaler and it rattled. She breathed out and then sucked at it. Roy stroked her hair. Just breathe. Storm soon pass. Flash, crash. Eight seconds. Then they heard a mechanical, tearing, screeching sound over the rain. Must be the bridge, whispered Roy, more to himself than to Dina. Disaster had a shape and a date, he thought. He could just see Dina's chest rise, hitch, and fall in the dark. How long would the stuff in the inhaler last? Their house was higher than some, but how would he know if the river had burst its banks and they had to climb onto the roof? The rain eased just after dawn. He left Dina sleeping and went outside into a drizzle. The Yalas River was still a raging, roiling scar across the land. He had built his house on a slight slope, and used concrete foundations to raise the floor. It had never flooded. Not yet. He jumped onto a crumbling wall nearby, part of an aqueduct, the elders said, and stood, looking east over the community of Baktu, towards the river. In the glow of dawn, he saw the bridge was really gone. Every resident of Baktu knew the story of the concrete bridge, first built in slavery time. It had cracked in an earthquake at the turn of the 20th century, and later that same year, a huge guango tree had been washed into it by the rains, backing up the silt-laden floodwaters, which then spread across the land. Public Works blew up the bridge because it was easier than taking out the tree. A new bridge was built, erected in less than a month by shirtless black men, supervised by sunburned white men, wearing hard hats and orange vests. A Bailey Bridge, it was called, the elders said, a wondrous contraption of steel triangles and wooden planks much higher over the river than the old one. The Bailey Bridge was supposed to be temporary, but the people of Baktu thought it would be there forever, so modern and clean it was. And it did last for nearly 70 years, but slowly the riverbanks began to erode, caused by sand miners and loggers in the mountains and recurrent floods, and soon there was a trench across the road near to the posts that supported the bridge. Soon be bridge to no damn place, the people of back to muttered. Thank you, Diana. Our final regional winner for the Pacific is Mary Rokanadravu from Fiji. Her story is The Night Watch. You live life as a writer, as an artist. 
and then what you live or what you observe uh, from your life, you inevitably take into your short story. My name is uh, Mary Rokunandravo and uh, I'm from Fiji. I told the story because of what I had personally experienced in pieces over many years and then it was all collated into one piece and told as one story. The, the short story, The Night Watch, is really about um, Christian fundamentalism and uh, it's about capitalism and, and the role that that plays, uh, I think, in, in the lives of ordinary people. Does a story answer any questions? My answer to that would be no. No story answers any questions. But does the story um, create questions? And my response would be, yes, it should. So what I'm hoping is not a feeling, but what I'm hoping is uh, that when a reader comes to read the short story, that they will have um, a lot of questions at the end of it, not related to the story itself, but related to the conditions in which we live. And um, in terms of Fiji, it would be around what we are experiencing under, I would say, Christian fundamentalism and poverty. Um, in other countries, it might be something different, but um, but that's what I what I can say. I think at this moment, it's not really about feeling, but uh, the fact that the reader should question, or should uh, should probably end up with questions about uh, how they live their life and how they perceive the world. Hello, my name is Janine. I am a First Nations Wiradjuri writer and teacher from Australia which is one of the many regions in the vast, nebulous, still shifting geopolitical space of the Commonwealth. It was a pleasure and a privilege to be one of a team of judges representing Africa, Asia, Canada and Europe, the Caribbean and Pacific regions. The quality and diversity across all regions was high. Stories from the Pacific region spoke to issues of climate change, extinction crisis, political instability, and redefining identities, among other things, both global and local. And that is why I am so delighted that you'll get to hear an excerpt from our regional Pacific winner, Nightwatch, now. Thank you. Puasa's mother rode the dawn milk truck into Suva. Her nephew, Samuela, drove for the Rewadere Limited. He began his route at five in the morning. He began collecting from small dairy farmers dotted along the Wendewara Flats on the banks of the Wendina River in darkness. The truck's headlights illuminating thick mists. There was the lowing of cows, their hides warm to the hand. The smell of dung from the mist-shrouded pastures sweet as minutes old dug loam. Bats gorged on low-hanging breadfruit. Once, Samuela had reached out and put his hand around a grown bat feeding thus. The creature shrieked, spreading its black wings wide. He never forgot how soft, how like silk it was, slipping out of his grasp. Its wild heart, its taut flesh. The rush of about 100 other bats, wings pulsing in a mist-wet glide over the low forests of Syria. By first light, they would be tucked into their wings like oversized ebony cocoons hanging from the gnarled arms of middle-range trees under the forest canopy, their bellies full. Only juveniles rested late. Their young bodies were new, learning the curve of the world and every slope and tilt of the earth. Their bones learning the cold rising from rivers that ran as dark threads on the flat regions below. Their eyes suddenly blinded by the first rays of the sun. It took time to learn to home, when to abandon the lush temptation of a red mango, the call of a bursting jackfruit, the tug of a cluster of sweet papayas, and how to smell the turn of night. Samuela turned to tell his silent aunt about the bat, then quickly held his tongue. She was seated tight as a soldier at drill, Stomach in, chest out, shoulders back, hands glued to her sides. He knew it would take Poasa some effort to ease her. He did not envy his cousin the task. He looked into the mist and whistled a gospel tune. 
At Vallelevu, about a kilometer before the Rewa Dairy factory, he put her in a taxi and slipped $20 in her green handbag. Puasa was an only son. His mother came with a mission. When she reached Navuni, she was welcomed with a smell of rotting, uncollected rubbish that stood at the end of the street. She gagged. She quickly paid the driver and sought directions from a child of about 12. Thank you, Mary. And huge congratulations to all five of our regional winners. I cannot emphasize enough that each of the authors you've heard from today is a winner. Our judges themselves from all five regions of the Commonwealth had to go one step further. And after hours of reading, discussing and rereading, they had to choose one overall winner of the 2022 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Will it be Ansika Kota, Sophia Maria Ma, Cecil Brown, Diana McCauley, Mary Rokonadravu, the overall winner of the 2022 Commonwealth Short Story Prize is... Hello? And Sika, this is Mr. G. I'm presenting the award ceremony for this year's prize. Uh, hey. It's my absolute pleasure to tell you that you and Sika Kota are the overall winner of the 2022 Commonwealth Short Story Prize. <laughs> what? Your story won. Surely not, are you sure? Are you sure? Congratulations. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Winning this award is such an honor, you know, I, you know, to have something that came out of my brain, came out of my mind, yeah, to, to, you know, for other people to feel, for them to feel something, anything. I mean, even if it wasn't what I intended, I think that is, I think that might be, part of the point of writing, actually. I think that might be the point of it. So to, to, to win this prize, it feels like, I, you know, there probably is a name for what I'm feeling and it's just, I just don't know it, but it's very pleasant. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. It's really good. I feel good and um, I'm really happy. Congratulations, Ansika. It's so wonderful to share this moment with you. Our warmest congratulations also go to this year's regional winners, the shortlisted and the longlisted writers. It's been a privilege to read your stories. If you'd like to read them too, the five winning stories are published by Granta Online and could be purchased in a limited edition collection from Paper and Ink. The shortlisted stories will be available to read on ADA, the Commonwealth Foundation's online literary magazine. Please don't forget, submissions for the 2023 Commonwealth Short Story Prize will be open from September the 1st, 2022. As the poet Maya Angelou wrote, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So make sure you send us your stories. We would love to read them and the world is waiting to hear them. On behalf of the Commonwealth Foundation and our friends and partners at Granta, the London Library and Paper and Ink, we wish you and your loved ones a happy and healthy year to come. We'll see you next year. Goodbye.
best day of everyone to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> but then I gotta freak out when I tell them my goodness.